The Ermac Centre is proud to present the SFU Fellows of the Royal Society of Canada Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts five presentations per semester. For the fall 2012 semester, the presenters belong to the Departments of History, Chemistry, the Centre for Dialogue, and the Beattie School of Business. Today's speaker is Dr. Jack Little from the Department of History. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a gallop for that, I apologize. It's a book that has over 400 pages and I thought I would hit the highlights with you today rather than focusing on one particular theme because part of the, part of the point I think is to talk about biography as a way of looking at various themes in, in history. So I'll begin with uh, the last year of his life. That's the picture up here, of that photograph is the last year of his life, 1908. The year of Quebec City's extravagant tercentenary celebration, which Viv Nellis wrote a prize-winning book on. The Municipal Council of Quebec announced that it re would rename Haldeman Street within the walls of the old city in honor of Sir Henri Gustave Jolie de Laubinière, who would die later that same year. Rather ironically, given that Jolie had dedicated much of his life to resolving conflicts between French-speaking and English-speaking Canadians, I'm hearing an echo, is that bothering anyone? Okay. This announcement threatened to cause a controversy along those same French-English lines, for it was greeted with protest by the city's English-speaking elite. While the Daily Telegraph agreed that, quote, the name of the Lobinière is illustrious in the history of Canada and of Quebec, and none has worn it with more honor and distinction to himself and the ancient capital, as well as to the country at large as Sir Henri. It argued that Jolly um, uh, himself would be opposed to the removal of, quote, so useful a reminder of such a distinguished figure in our annals as Governor Haldimand. So they didn't want to erase an English name with a French name, which has happened quite a lot in Quebec in the last few years. Better to replace one of the names chosen from the almost exhausted calendar of saints, the Telegraph said, which strangers found so confusing, or a more generic name such as Garden Street or Rampart Street, they're not, they're f thereby not offending any susceptibilities. A member of the long-established literary and historical society agreed, adding uh, the additional argument that Haldeman Street was not suitable because of its small size. Quote, surely the name de Lobinier deserves a nobler prominence, unquote. Another local newspaper suggested that Haldeman's name was suitable to the narrow and less frequent, frequented street in the old upper town eloquent of the past, but the name Lobinier should be given to one of the more modern streets, say near the building of that legislature of which he was so long a distinguished member. This advice, which nicely illustrated the tension in Jolie's life between tradition and modernity, was heeded. For Haldeman Street has survived in old Quebec, and the name Lobinier is to be found on the street fronting the provincial legislature today. Such an honor may seem somewhat surprising, given that Jolie had quit the legislature in protest 23 years earlier, and that his premiership had been brief and controversial. While he was admittedly not in the first rank of importance as a Canadian or Quebec politician, however, Jolie did serve as a provincial party leader for 16 years. He managed to govern effectively, if briefly, as premier during a particularly difficult time of Quebec's history, and he was rewarded with a knighthood for his efforts to ease tensions between French and English Canada during the critical years between the Louis Riel crisis and the Manitoba schools question, i.e. 1885 to 1896. He was also Canada's most prominent forest conservation advocate, a capable reform-oriented member of the uh, federal Laurier administration, and undoubtedly the most influential lieutenant governor British Columbia has ever had. Very few Canadians could boast such a varied and useful career, but unlike contemporaries in Quebec, such as Israel Tarte, Hector Louis Langevin, Adolphe Chapleau, Godefroy Langlois, Henri Mercier, Louis-Antoine de, de Saul, and Wilfrid Laurier, Jolie has not been the subject of a book-length biography. In fact, he's been pretty much ex completely ignored. One probable reason that Quebec historians have not paid more attention to Jolie is that he was a Canadian nationalist, first and foremost, going so far as to break publicly with his liberal colleagues over their political exploitation of Riel's execution in 1885. That's when he quit uh, politics in Quebec. Furthermore, he became more sympathetic to British imperialism as he grew older and he and his family became too assimilated into the English-speaking world to fit comfortably into what Jocelyn Le Tourneau refers to as Quebec's grand narrative. 
The fact that Joliet was a descendant of New France's office-holding and seigneurial elite may be yet another reason that he has not received more attention. For Quebec historians of the post-quiet revolution era have been fixated on the rise of modernity. Fernand Roy's seminal study argues that the influence of church-inspired conservatism was quite limited, even in pre-1960 Quebec, and that the prevailing ideology was liberalism, the ultimate goal of which was the defense of private property. Although he was a businessman and a Protestant who promoted a number of progressive reforms, Jolie did not fit this mold because his in liberal individualism was compromised by his paternalism and his social conservatism. And you'll see paternalism is a word I use a lot in this uh, trying to talk about him. As Arno Mayer has argued for the pre-1914 Europe in general, however, and Eugene Weber for rural France in particular, central values of the Ancien Régime persisted well into the industrial era. Wealth and prestige may not have been as tied to noble status and land ownership in Quebec as it was in much of Europe, but there was no successful revolution in Quebec after all. I mean, the, the uh, seigneurial system persisted right up until 1854. And not all members of the seigneurial uh, class became impoverished and inconsequential after the conquest, as historians such as Alfred Dubuc and uh, Fernand Ouellette have implied. Members of the old Canadian nobility sold 33 seigneuries between 1782 and 1840, but the fact remains that Jolie was far from the only member of the landed elite to play an important role in Quebec politics and society during the 19th and 20th centuries. As Daniel Salé has pointed out, generations of Tachereaux, Massons, and Casgrains provided more than their share of ministers, high-ranking civil servants, magistrates, lieutenant governors, and bishops. And Brian Young has recently argued uh, in his work on the Tachereau family that what he calls feudal vestiges survived well into the Victorian and Edwardian eras. This is not something that Quebec historians particularly uh, want to hear about, I don't think. The degree to which Joly was perceived to be a gentleman in the traditional sense is illustrated by the description penned by Senator Louis, uh, Laurent Olivier David for the Courrier de Montréal in 1875. This is uh, another one late in, in his last year of life after he's retired to his seniory. So this is what David had to say. Good build and kind face, noble and distinguished deportment, curly-haired, graying, thick mustache, looks like a serviceman on leave. A pleasant and gifted speaker, an elegant, easy, polished, original and caustic orator, quick-witted. Knows how to skillfully let fly remarks, always careful not to offend an adversary. A quick, curious, and highly cultured mind prefer, prefers useful and practical things to grand concepts and profound theories. A strict and upright conscience, free of prejudices and weaknesses, resisting the seduction and tri trickery of politics, which explains why he was never very successful as a politician. Uh, wealthy, very wealthy, and proportionately charitable, always ready to give to the destitute and all good causes. To complete his portrayal of Jolly as a landed aristocrat, David added that he was, quote, more content on his vast estates among his many workers with their calloused hands and tanned faces than in the chic drawing rooms or the chamber of deputies, unquote. That's uh, an exaggeration, but uh, anyway, you can see the photograph suggests that. So linked to the theme of social class, a central thread in my forthcoming book will be ideology. But this is not a primarily an, an intellectual history. As Patrice Duty uh, noted in the introduction of his biography of one of Jolie's liberal colleagues, ideology cannot be firmly grasped unless the politics that express it or fail to express it are understood. Duty adds, uh, political intrigues show us how ideologies really work. The fact remains, however, that ideology is also more than politics, particularly for a man like Jolie for whom home, family, and religion were at least as important as public life. European political historians have shifted their attention towards the small scale and the private, rejecting the history of the state as an abstract entity on the grounds that it is, quote, a story of empty appearances that exaggerates the state's monopoly over power. Canadian historians, on the other hand, are still obsessed by the rise of the modern state, but they are at least beginning to write political biographies that transcend the divide, divide between the public and the private. Pioneer example. Example, again, is Brian Young's revisionist study of Georges-Étienne Cartier, in which politics takes a back seat to the subject's business and personal life. As an upstanding man, in contrast to Cartier, I was hoping to find uh, some scandals like Brian found for Cartier, no such luck with Jolie. 
Jalil was less patently ambitious and more, and more dedicated to public life out of a paternalistic sense of duty. Cittolini notes that in the world of private relations can be found a complex web of regulations and discipline operating quite independently of the world of formal power. But it does not follow that Jolie's public face was much different than his private one. The advertised title to the, of this talk to the contrary, it says Public and Private Lives. The title of my book is Public and Private Life. Uh, the, um, it's life rather than lives, not because the private was public as in today's invasive popular culture, but because the two spheres formed a seamless web as far as Jolie was concerned, even if he was careful not to take advantage of his public position for private ends. The fact that Jolie was the product of two quite different worlds, patrician Catholic Quebec on his mother's side and bourgeois Protestant France uh, on, on that of his father, sort of interesting reversal of the old world and the new, um, meant that he experienced in a particularly acute sense the conflicting pressures exerted by the transition from pre-industrial to industrial society. But that tension should not be exaggerated, for to translate a French saying, Jolie always appears to have felt comfortable in his own skin. Richard Bushman's study of refinement in the Republican United States is instructive in this respect, for he finds that after the turn of the 19th century, the culture of gentility, as reflected in popular manners, housing styles, garden landscapes, and so on, began exercising increasing influence over much of the population. That's the manor house there, which is a historic site today. Um, the whole estate is now owned by the Quebec government. To explain this apparent pa paradox, Bushman suggests that, quote, capitalism and gentility were allies in forming the modern economy, because a capitalist economy requires both frantic getting and energetic spending. Jolie was actually quite parsimonious, but this did not prevent him from conforming to the image of a landed gentleman. Nor does Jolie appear to have been greatly influenced or greatly conflicted by the fact that he was immersed in two distinct linguistic cultures. As someone raised in a French-speaking environment, but with English-speaking relatives on his mother's side, his, mother had some, his mother's mother was an Anglophone, um, as well as an English-speaking wife. In fact, his dual religious heritage was more significant at a time when marriages between Catholics and Protestants were rare in the country, uh, and, and the country was torn by sectarian conflicts. So it's not so much the linguistic duality that is, is interesting with Jolie, it's the religious duality because that's what the fight was all about in Canada in those days. But Jolie re reconciled that dichotomy in his own mind by abandoning the Swiss Calvinism of his father's family and adhering to the moderate Anglicanism of his wife. So as soon as he comes back from Paris he and get marries, he becomes an Anglican. Jolie's duality uh, both helped and hindered his political career. It ensured support from Quebec's influential Anglo-Protestant bourgeoisie, but also a degree of mistrust by the province's French-speaking majority for whom Catholicism was an intrinsic part of their cultural identity. And this period, 1870s, when he was in premier and so on, is the height of ultramontanism, uh, conservatism in Quebec. Furthermore, influential though he was, Jolie was too proud, too ethical, and too lacking in the common touch to become a political force of the first rank. And he willingly stepped aside for the more flamboyant Henri Mercier as leader of the provincial liberals, as well as being content to play the role of efficient administrator in the Laurier government and behind the scenes diplomat uh, when he was in Victoria. Supporters of the biographical approach have traditionally stressed the importance of individual agency and contingency in history. And some of those of you who are Canadian historians will recognize uh, Donald Creighton there. And my biography does aim to uh, present Jolie as a living and active human being rather than an object of abstract forces. But a study of his political career also serves the broader purpose of shedding light on the tensions within Confederation and how they were accommodated, though never resolved. This is not a study of a representative figure then, but neither is it focused on the achievements of a particular individual. On a more strictly ideological level, Jolie's life helps us to appreciate in relatively concrete terms the tensions and contradictions within Canada's increasingly dominant liberal value system or what Ian Mackay refers to as this country's prevailing liberal order. Jolie certainly valued individual liberty, economic progress, and private property, the three keystones to uh, the liberal order. Um, but the fact that he clung to the land he inherited and to the aristocratic ethos that was part of his family heritage reveals how strongly he believed in the preservation of the traditional order as well as the social obligations that came with being a patrician. <laughs> 
Canadian historians have generally associated paternalism in the public arena with the pre-rebellion era uh, and with authoritarian Tories such as Upper Canada's Governor Sir Francis Bond Head. But the winning of responsible government in the 1840s meant that initiatives such as penal reform and Aboriginal relocation, two of Bond Head's pet projects, became more closely associated with the expanding powers of the modern state. So in other words, I'm saying that uh, paternalism and the rise of the modern state are not necessarily antithetical. From this perspective, well, I already said that. So moving on, recently Danny Sampson has pointed to Nova Scotia's influential agricultural reformer, John Young, who was a disciple of Scotland's Sir John Sinclair, as a man whose conservative radicalism, quote, looked backward as much as forward, invoking the Tory myth of stability, elite emulation, and harmonious order, while at the same time urging innovation and enterprise. Similarly, Jolie did not find it particularly difficult to reconcile his defense of the Catholic Church's official status in Quebec with his advocacy of more state support for public schools, or his economic liberalism with his promotion of greater state involvement in forest conservation. From his perspective, the state should be a protector of the public good as well as a guardian of individual property rights. Jolie's rather paternalistic liberalism then was broader than what the definition of Roy and Mackay or Mackay uh, encompasses, and it clearly resonated with many Canadians during a period when the certainties of the pre-industrial world were being turned upside down. So I'll turn now to a brief summary of the book, uh, seven or uh, nine chapters, I guess. I'll go through it quickly. The first chapter examines Jolie's deep patrician roots in New France and Lower Canada, beginning with uh, Louis Théandre, uh, Chartier de Laubinière, who was son of Louis XIII's uh, physician and arrived in Canada in 1651. Five generations of Chartier de Laubinière were all highly ranked public officials, and it was the second of them, René Louis, who was, who was granted the seigneury that would remain in the family's hands until the mid-20th century. It's quite amazing, that seigneury never left the uh, Laubinière, Chartier de Laubinière hands uh, from the 1650s to the 1970s. But the Laubinière land was poorly drained, and it would... Oh, I've got a map here. It's... Uh, what happened? I guess it's out of order. Anyway, lost it. But uh, it's just southeast of Quebec City and the, the south shore of the St. Lawrence. The Laubinière land was poorly drained, and it would serve largely as a source of social status rather than as economic or political power base until Henri Gustave's parents became the first seniors to live on it. The male Chartier de Laubinière line had ended with Henri Gustave's grandfather, and it was his Swiss-born father, Pierre Gustave Joly, the adventuresome member of a French wine merchant family who developed a thriving lumber business on the seigneury. After spending his school and college years in Paris, where his father associated with such prominent, his father lived in Paris as much as he did, or more than he lived in Canada, actually, with such prominent liberals as Lamennais and the exiled Louis-Joseph Papineau during the 1840s, and where he would graduate from the Sorbonne, Henri Gustave carried on the family lumber business until his death in 1908. But he did little to modernize it or expand it, and he continued to rely on the local farmers to serve as the suppliers of logs for his sawmills. Even as a businessman stepping into his father's shoes then, he played the role of local patrician. My second chapter, oops, we'll go ahead with those here, focuses on the family. So this is uh, his wife close to him and you can, sons and daughters, the surviving ones. There were several others who didn't survive uh, ch uh, childhood. Uh, it's interesting, his parents had two children. He had about 10, but his parents eventually split up. Um, Second chapter focuses on Henri Gustave's close relations with his wife, Margareta Josepha Gowan, and their children, most of whom did not become integrated into Quebec society despite their education in local French language institutions and their family links with Quebec City's English-speaking bourgeoisie. Rather, several sons and daughters became associated with the British military through profession or marriage in a neat symbiosis between the traditions of the Ancien Régime elite and the opportunities provided by the modern British Empire. Only the eldest daughter and the eldest son of the seven offspring who survived to maturity would remain in Quebec. The product of an unhappy marriage and the son of a demanding and remote father, Jolie was himself a loving husband and parent, every bit as engaged with his daughters as his sons. It's interesting the, the, the juxtaposition of the boys looking out and the daughters focusing on the books there. Um, 
A romantic, romantic, thinly fictionalized account of the family when the children were young can be found in Townhouse Country House, written by Jolie's granddaughter, Hazel Boswell. Eldest son, Edmond, a lawyer like his father, managed the family lumber business during the years that Jolie was in, in Ottawa and Victoria. That's that other photograph. Um, but uh, that's Edmond uh, standing up, uh, looking quite military, because he's the only one in the family who didn't become a soldier. Um, his, um, yeah, so, but not without frequent and lengthy letters of advice. It's interesting, even from Victoria, when Jolie's quite old, he's writing letters. That's why it's such a rich archive, seven microfilm reels of letters I've had to work with, uh, giving advice to his son constantly. So he never really emerges from the shadow of his father, and he dies three or four years after his father dies. Um, his other two sons graduated from the Royal Military College and spent their careers as British military engineers in India, retiring in England. Finally, the fact that all four daughters married engineers, two of whom were British military men, indicates how, the, how strong the role of family connections was in their courtships. I can just imagine they didn't get much, they were kept on a tight leash. I have time to give you only one example of how Jolie played a dominant role within the uh, domestic sphere. In 1890, he wrote the following words uh, on behalf of his youngest daughter, Ethel Blanche, who was the little girl at his feet there, to the smitten English officer, Captain Dudley Ackland Mills, who was about to return to England. Ethel has shown me your letter. You ask her to answer yes or no, and though she has decided to answer no, I understand that she should shrink from giving you what would appear such a brutal answer to a letter like yours. It was a great relief to her when I offered to write in her stead. You who at 30 think it perfectly right to give your love to an ideal that within three months it has assumed the form of three different women. Will you deny to a girl of 20 the right of keeping her heart for her own ideal? You say that if she's not already engaged, you will not give her up. I earnestly hope that you will give her up and spare her the pain if she is compelled by you to answer once more of answering with one single word, no. Jolie closed by admitting that his letter might seem harsh, but but look around you, you will find other families where the children love their parents and where both the children and parents humbly try to do their duty to God and to one another. Four years later, the parsimonious Jolie admonished the somewhat pampered Ethel, quote, to be saving and only get useful things. Really, it's not my fault if our children have got extravagant ideas or mama's eye either about money matters. Soon afterwards, she would marry Dudley with her father's blessing, that's five years after that letter I read, and spend the rest of her life in Cornwall, England. Historians of gender and the family have until recently associated what they refer to as the cult of domesticity with the rise of industrial capitalism. They argued that the middle class home was increasingly viewed as the male breadwinner's haven from the pressures and anxieties of the market at a time when the public sphere was becoming more remote and formal. Leonor Davidoff and Catherine Hall shifted attention somewhat from the economic transition to the rise of evangelical religion. And still more recently, John Gillis has pointed to the rise of secularism and individualism, stating that the Victorian middle classes began to attribute to those whom they lived with quote, qualities that previously had been associated with divine or communal archetypes. So much more emotional uh, baggage placed on the family. But Henri Gustave Jolie was neither alienated from the public sphere, or an evangelical, nor a secular individualist. And his patrician paternalism was perfectly compatible with strong attachment to the family. Even though relatively little is, no is known about aristocratic masculinity in the Victorian era, the dichotomy between a new bourgeois masculinity attuned to the market and a less domesticated, genteel masculinity grounded in land ownership has broken down in recent studies. And just as family historians now insist that the division between the home and the outside world is largely an artificial construct and that the family was not simply a dependent variable in the process of modernization, but a factor in that process, so I argue that Jolie's paternalism and frugality were characteristics that mark not only his gender identity and family life, but his public career as well. In the third chapter, and that's where I think the map was supposed to be, um, um, I examine the impact of the abolition of seigneurial tenure in 1854, a topic that has remained almost entirely unexplored by Quebec's historians. I find this astounding, this incredible, important step, 1854, abolition of seigneurial tenure. There's tons of studies on the pre-1854 period, nothing on the post-1854 period, although there's a young man in Sherbrooke who's now writing on it. Um, elements of the seigneurial system persisted well into the 20th century, 
And my rather paradoxical finding is that this legislation actually entrenched the Jolly family more firmly in their Lobinier property. In fact, they were the only family to ever own that property, as I mentioned earlier, which was acquired by the Quebec government in 1967 and now has the official status as a historic site. Henri Gustave was identified as a senior throughout his life, and one example of how he clung to this status was his insistence on maintaining the seigneurial pew in the parish church, even though this privilege had been abolished with seigneurial tenure, and of course his family were Protestants, so they never went to the church. <laughs> Uh, his, fa his father actually uh, had, uh, because he had so much conflict with the Sanseterres in con contrast to Henri Gustave, uh, the uh, local people took the, pe uh, the pew out of the church and threw it in the river. Uh, more importantly, the fact that he was no longer obliged to grant lots to Sanseterre, and again, I don't know if I've got time to get into the seigneurial system, but it's not like freehold where tenants have very few rights. So under, the fr under the seigneurial system, you have to grant a, a lot to someone who asks for it. Um, so it, when that ends in 1854, then they're outright owners of their land. So they have actually stronger uh, hold over it, uh, over the land that hasn't been granted yet. And a lot of it hadn't been granted yet because it wasn't very, uh, value, it wasn't very arable. So he has, uh, this is very good for the lumber business. He's got a secure uh, um, area where he can uh, uh, log. And he has a dependent labor force because these people are the only people he hires. And of course, they owe him money from rents and so on. So it's a symbiotic relationship um, in a way, uh, uh, a rather um, exploitative one as well, I suppose. Um, Jolie was therefore thereby able to support his family in some comfort while effectively practicing what was the only sustained yield forestry system in the province or the country, uh, as far as I'm aware. In short, Lobinier presents another example of how the seigneurial system was not as incompatible with capitalist production as historians of rural Quebec once assumed. Quebec historians have also associated what they refer to as the agri-forestry system, with the province's marginal colonization zones, namely what I just described, people who uh, cannot make a living on the farm, so they have to work in the woods in the winter, and, the, and of course they have to work for these large uh, uh, logging entrepreneurs, so it's a kind of a system of dependency. That's always been associated with the northern part of Quebec, the, uh, the, the colonization zones, but I found it here in, in the old seigneurial zone as well. Um, Perhaps not surprisingly then, Jolie was repeatedly elected by acclamation in the county of Lobinier. He never spent a cent, a cent running for office. And this constituency was crucial to his political career because as a Paris-educated Protestant, he could never completely overcome his outsider status in French-speaking Quebec. Nor did he become complete, entirely assimilated into the English-speaking community, uh, business community despite marrying into it and playing a prominent role in the Anglican Church. Chapter 4 examines Jolie's role as liberal member of Quebec's Legislative Assembly, where he was a champion of fiscal prudence, honest government, and agricultural reform. These were all signature liberal tenets, but Jolie's reform initiatives also reflected his patrician sense of responsibility and evident distaste for the materialist values and ruthless business practices of the bourgeoisie. Like his fellow Rouge deputies, he opposed confederation, largely because he felt that it would be unstable and lead to the inevitable centralization of power to the detriment of the French-Canadian minority. This is in 1865-67, before confederation took place. And while he quickly accepted the new constitutional arrangement, he remained a champion of provincial rights throughout his life. Jolie's reformist tendencies trumped his fiscally conservative ones in the case of the Beauport Asylum, which he felt the government should purchase because it would be motivated to heal people rather than confining them as long as possible for financial reasons. Conflict of interest, he said, if you're going to have a privately owned asylum, what's the point of releasing people? You'll just cut into your profits. There was no conflict between this liberal-minded stance and Jolie's paternalist instincts, but he was also democratic enough to advocate the secret ballot as well as single-day elections to oppose the $2,000 property qualifications for electoral candidacy and to favor extending the franchise beyond property holders. Jolie's elitism was manifested instead in his advocacy of an intellectual qualification for voting, claiming that in China, a country that had preceded the West in becoming civilized, it was intelligence alone that was honored. Contradictory as some of Jolie's policies may seem then, they make sense from the perspective of someone influenced by the liberal circles his father had moved in and whose privileged class status gave him a sense of social responsibility. 
Chapter 5 reviews the one aspect of Jolie's life that has received detailed attention from historians, his role as provincial premier between March 1878 and October 1879. There's an MA thesis on this. Um, so if this works, there, oh, there's the map. Um, anyway, that's the uh, Lieutenant Governor Letelier Saint-Just uh, down below. It's a famous controversy. Letelier dismissed the Conservative government and appointed Jolie, and it's, it's a big issue in Canadian constitutional history, but I don't have time to get into it. Anyway, um, during this period, Jolie was faced with making hard political choices, choices that forced him to clarify some of the ambiguities in his liberal ideology, particularly when it came to the role it should be played by government. Although he's been a persistent critic of the Conservative government expenditures on the North Shore Railway, for example, as Premier he would ensure that the line was completed despite the deepening economic recession. And he would become a vociferous critic of the succeeding Conservative administration's sale of the same railway to private interests. A good example of Jolie's liberalism combined with his paternalism is, ab is his abolition of the law that made an employer's sworn testimony concerning employment conditions for domestics or servants inviolable in case of a salary dispute. Quite remarkable to think about it. The employer's testimony is considered evidence of, of enough. So he abolished that. His organizational skills earned him widespread respect, but his economizing policies in areas such as education proved to be no match for conservative obstructionism and bribery, and he was forced to step down after several of his supporters crossed the floor. In short, Jolie's insistence that government operate within its means and without uh, becoming beholden to wealthy property funders served both as an asset and as a handicap to his political career. He's constantly called upon because he's known as so honest, but then he becomes a bit of an, an embarrassment because he's so honest. Which is why Laurier got rid of him by appointing him Lieutenant Governor of BC. In Chapter 6, I examine how, having resigned from provincial politics as a result of the Riel Affair in 1885, Jolie eventually returned to the public stage because of his growing concern about the backlash in English Canada against the Quebec government's nationalist policies. With a strong sense of noblesse oblige, he spoke in Toronto and Kingston in defense of Premier Mercier's management of the Jesuits' estates question, another one of these famous Canadian constitutional crises. This had caused an uproar in Ontario leading to the resignation of Prime Minister Macdonald's right-hand man and the formation of the Equal Rights Association, because Mercier had invited the Pope to ar arbitrate the division among Catholic institutions of money granted uh, by the province to compensate for land forfeited by the Jesuits in the early 19th century. It's complicated, but anyway, the whole key issue is you don't dare in Canada invite a foreign power, the Pope, to get involved in any way, even if it's a strictly Catholic matter. A huge backlash in Ontario about this. Futile as Jolie's efforts were, they earned him a knighthood in 1895, the year he began to speak out on behalf of the Catholic minority in Manitoba, who were challenging the unconstitutional termination of official status for their schools. There's a direct link here. Um, that backlash in Ontario, you know, slops over into Manitoba, and Manitoba abolishes state support for Catholic schools in 1890, and French as an official language. Um, this did not prevent uh, Jolie from supporting Laurier's opposition to, this is again complicated, the Liberals come into power by opposing remedial legislation, even though they're the ones defending the minority. It's hard to explain. Anyway, he follows Laurier's line on this, which is that you shouldn't coerce a provincial government to do something. Uh, as fellow Liberals of the Manitoba, Manitoba government's Liberal, we're Liberals, we'll get them to give the Catholics a better deal. So Jolie went along with that, uh, which may seem a little bit cynical, but anyway, um, his I argue the bottom line, he was, a, he was for provincial rights and minority rights, but above all, he was for national unity. And he feared that a uh, remedial bill would split the country apart. Um, similarly, despite his imperialist sympathies, Jolie refused all pleas to publicly support the Imperial Federation movement on the grounds that it would stir up more divisions in the country. They kept sending letters to him and putting his name on letterhead and so on for the Imperial Federation movement. He kept saying, no, 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 I don't want to be a part of this. The other focus of Jolie's attention during this decade or so was the forest conservation movement as examined in Chapter 7. Deeds of sale to local farmers in Lobinière included the proviso that they were to reserve a specific section of each lot for their own firewood only. And this paternalistic restriction was enforced by Jolie's successors well into the 20th century. 
So you can see a seigneurial hold over here. This is private land that you've bought from somebody, and on the deed it says you can't cut land, you, you have to keep this section for firewood. And his concern was they were too juvenile to know how to do that themselves. And he actually took people to court when they did uh, uh, cut logs on that, uh, on that land. As a lumber producer who was familiar with forest practices in Europe, as well as a former premier with strong political connections throughout the country, Joly was well placed to become a prominent spokesman for the conservation movement, becoming first vice president of the American Forestry Congress in 1883. Despite his antipathy to an expansionist government bureaucracy, Joly's recommendations foreshadowed the American progressive support for more active state involvement in forest conservation. Thus, he advocated strict control over the minimum size of trees to be harvested on crown lands, legislation against the export of raw logs from crown lands, prohibition of the cutting of hemlock solely for its bark to be used in the tanning industry, which was devastating the forests in parts of the eastern townships and so on, and sizable fines to prevent forest fires and many other things. On a more positive note, Jolie also advocated education of the province's youth about the need for conservation. And it was due to his initiative that Arbor Day first became a Quebec school holiday in 1886. The paternalistic nature of Jolie's reformism is nicely illustrated by his advice to teachers that their students should be informed that it might take, quote, 20, 30, 40 years or more before a tree was big enough to cut down. But even if they had moved away or died in the meantime, their work would not have been lost. If you do not profit by it, others will, and you will have done more than many a grown up man has done you will have left something useful behind you. Jolie's long-term view is also illustrated by his opposition to the cutting of pulpwood on crown lands, as well as on his own land. Quote, by destroying the young trees, which in a few years would replace the mature wood fit for, a lo uh, fit for log making. By the way, 1880s is when the pulp and paper industry takes off in Canada. Uh, one condemns a forest to a speedy death, just as a nation would be swept out of existence if every child that was born was done away with while in its infancy. If the pulp were manufactured in Canada, Jolie argued, it would be but half an evil, but most of it was being sold on the American market. The same combination of liberalism and paternalism is examined in Chapter 8, which focuses on Jolie's role as Minister of Internal Revenue in the Laurier government between 1896 and 1900. A diligent and effective administrator, Jolie contributed to the state formation project that is generally assumed to have replaced the paternalist system of government by instituting a greater degree of uniformity in the country's weights and measure system. Um, barrel of apples was a diff different measure in every province uh, before Jolie came along. While intensifying the government's campaign against the uh, illicit production of alcohol, however, Jolie was too sensitive to the Catholic Church's stance to become an advocate of prohibition. So he clamps down on uh, bootlegging and, and that sort of thing, but he certainly doesn't support prohibition because the Catholic Church is opposed to it. He did take a strong stance, however, against his liberal colleagues' demands that employees of his department who were suspected to be conservative supporters be replaced with the party faithful. That almost brought his career to an end uh, because he refused to dismiss people in his department who were thought to be conservatives. And of course, whether they were or not, uh, the patronage system was such that you wanted to sweep out the old and bring in the new. And he, he took a firm stand on this and uh, ultimately prevailed. In his book on the history of political patronage in Canada, journalist Jeffrey Simpson argues that Laurier was a successful prime minister because he, quote, preferred to in imitate the dubious morality of Sir John A. rather than the dismal rectitude of previous liberal leaders, Alexander Mackenzie and Edward Blake. Tellingly enough, Jolie is completely ignored by Simpson and the academic scholars who studied the patronage issue, perhaps because he does not fit the stereotype of a corrupt politi Quebec politician such as Israel Tart who famously declared that elections were not won with prayers. But if Simpson is right in stating that Mackenzie and Blake, as heirs of Upper Canada's clear grit ethic, held a more stunted version of the vision of the nation than did Macdonald or Laurier, I would argue the same cannot be said of, of Jolie. He had a more intimate knowledge of the country's two solitudes, to echo uh, novelist Hugh McLennan, than either of these prime ministers, as well as a great, greater sympathy for non-European immigrants, such as the Chinese, whom he defended against BC's exclusionary policies. In practical, in fact, when he was appointed to BC, there was a lot of concern that people in BC would really be ticked off because he had been so outspoken in, in defense of the Chinese before he came here. In practical, as, it may, have, uh, as may have been his vision of a liberal party that took firm stand on political honesty and integrity, 
Had that party done so, this is where I do a little sermonizing, had that party done so in the past century, there might have been developed less cynicism and resentment on the part of a general public, all too aware that its tax dollars are directed towards the party's faithful and the corporate interests who have filled its war chest. That's my response to Jeffrey Simpson. Finally, in the last chapter, I, I turn to the public role that perhaps best suited Jolie's patrician status and diplomatic temperament, namely that of Lieutenant Governor of BC. Um, I've got a couple of shots here. There he is in the garden in Victoria with his two Chinese cooks and his wife and his chickens. Um, in fact, he is the only outsider to have ever held that position in BC. This was no sinecure, especially for a man of Jolie's ad advanced years in 1900, <clears throat> for he was largely responsible for introducing the party system uh, that stabilized governance in the fractious West Coast province. Prior to 1903, and it took him three years, when Jolie dismissed Premier Pryor and invited the conservative Richard McBride to form the government because he had the majority in the legislature, elected members had tended to ally themselves to whichever ministry could offer their constituency and themselves as investors the most lucrative railway contract. Jolie's mission, in short, was to stabilize the state in order to restore the investor confidence that would ensure the continued economic growth of British Columbia as a satellite economy of central Canada. Ian Mackay does not include the implementation of the party system as one of his seven arresting moments in the development of the Canadian Liberal Revolution. But in playing a major role in this development, I would argue, Jolie can certainly be seen as an agent of what Mackay refers to as Canada's project of liberal order or rule. Furthermore, while Mackay's liberal order framework pays little attention to the fostering of loyalty to sovereign and country, by projecting a dignified nonpartisan image as Queen Victoria's local representative at a time when Britain uh, was at war in South Africa, Jolie contributed to the popular legitimization of the state in British Columbia. Somewhat paradoxically then, Jolie de Laubinière's patrician background made him an ideal agent for the implementation of a less personal and, uh, and less paternalist uh, political system, one that facilitated capitalist expansion during the era that Mackay sees as the apex of the liberal project. In fact, there are basic similarities between Jolie's political ideology, I think, and the red Toryism that was identified in the 1960s as distinctively Canadian. For that political ideology, which has since been crushed by neoconservatism, or maybe neoliberalism is a better word, favored traditional values and institutions, the decentralization of state power, small business, and volunteerism to solve social problems such as poverty. Gad Horowitz, applying Louis Hartz's fragment thesis, claimed that red Toryism resulted from the impact of the Tory loyalist touch on the dominant bourgeois liberal ideology. Um, the example of Jolie, however, suggests that it was not necessarily as exclusive to English Canada as Horowitz and others have assumed. But the fact remains that Jolie would never consider joining a conservative party that he associated with unprincipled profligacy, intolerance, and corruption. Jolie's Protestantism, his attachment to family, and his distaste for political cronyism also placed, him, placed strict limits on his public career, so that, as I said earlier, he is, today he is largely a forgotten historical figure in a country that remains sharply divided along linguistic lines. I'd argue that his life and career are of interest, however, if only because they suggest that the new urban and industrial order of Victorian and Edwardian eras did not sweep away the social, economic, and political influence of the old patrician elite as easily or as quickly as historians of Quebec and Canada have tended to assume, and that the paternalist ethos was not necessarily incompatible with liberal reform. I just want to close with a final word on the question of biography as historical genre, which is in the title, I guess, that I used for today. This life history of a prominent uh, national figure represents a rather sharp focus a shift in focus on my part, uh, as previous, my previous research has been largely on history at a regional and local level, and my preferred approach has been microhistorical. But biography, too, offers the opportunity to examine the generalized and the abstract through the lens of the personal and the particular, particularly the new approach to uh, biography that, in Jeff Ely's words, revisits individual lives as complex texts in which the large questions the same large questions that inspired the social historians were embedded. Perhaps the best label for my study is what Alice Kessler Harris refers to as antibiography. In her words, rather than offering history as a background or introducing it in order to locate an individual in time, the antibiography asks how the individual life helps us to make sense of a piece of the historical process, which is what I've done with Jolie, I think. Uh, even though I came across that quote after I read the book, or 
wrote the book. This is not great man history, but neither does it approach Jolie as a typical example of the late 19th century Canadian male, even of the social elite. It should re be remembered that microhistory does not simply address the larger historical questions by approaching the local as a case study or the individual as a representative figure, which is what most people think microhistory does. Rather, as Michael Gardner states, microhistory emphasizes, quote, the role of social contradictions in generating social change. This observation applies nicely to Jolie, for he was born into Quebec's old Catholic seigneurial elite on his mother's side, but raised in the commercial and liberal Paris of his Protestant father's family. Therefore, his role as father, businessman, and public figure can only be understood as a product of those very different, even conflicting, social and cultural influences. That said, I don't accept the new postmodern cultural approach to biography that would argue that any attempt to reconcile the apparent contradictions in Jolie's life is fruitless, because in the words of Joe Burr Margadant, the subject of biography is no longer the coherent self, but rather a self that is performed to create an impression of coherence, or an individual with multiple selves whose different manifestations reflect the passage of time, the demands and options of different settings, or the various ways that others seek to present represent that person. As Lois Banner has argued in response, such a stance implies a denial of the probability that elements of personality developed in childhood can remain coherent over a lifetime, or that social and cultural modalities that influence personal de personality development can encourage the production of a fixed core within an individual persona." Unquote. Despite Jolie's inconsistencies, there's little evidence, in my view, that he felt internally conflicted or that his worldview changed substantially over time. To repeat then, my goal in writing the forthcoming book was to use the life of Sir Henri Gustave Jolie de Laubinière as a window onto a number of important developments and themes in Quebec and Canadian history. As for Jolie himself, I approached him as a unique individual, but also as one who self-consciously played out the role written for him as a descendant of one of Canada, French Canada's most distinguished families as well as the son of a quintessentially modern man. I would even argue that Jolie was a representative figure insofar as the conflicting forces that he was subjected to personally were those that strained Canadian society as a whole, and in a sense, continue to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Thank you very much. And uh, I might just add as a postscript, he had a brother who didn't uh, this didn't work out quite so well. His brother joined the British military. He was very reckless. He was at um, uh, he was in the Crimean War, and then he was in the Indian Mutiny. And because he was tried to play this heroic character to live up to his father's expectations, and his father's always criticizing him, he ended up, you know, at the uh, at L the Siege of Lucknow, uh, doing something very reckless and being killed as a very young man. So you can see he's trying to play out his mother's side of the family and appease his father. So he's, uh, there, there are different. Uh, scripts that could have been played out in that family. <coughs> so, people have questions. I can give them uh, the microphone because we're uh, recording this. Jack, I think this is going to be your most important book, and I, I certainly hope it gets translated as well. Um, <laughs> if a student goes to the um, uh, site Point Plateau, Plateau, do they learn anything about the family or forestry or politics? They learn a lot about the family. I mean, there's a, there's a whole team working there during the summer, and it's a very popular place. It's a kind of a, it's a funny thing, because the Quebec government, when Ottawa, the Parks Canada was going to take it over, and the Quebec government got very upset about this. So they expropriated it, basically. But they won't put any money into it. So it's all, it's now a garden. It's a, one of the Ca Quebec's major botanical gardens, because one of Jolie's uh, daughter-in-law was a wealthy American heiress, so she put a lot of money into the place. Um, and so they have to raise money in order to keep this place going. The Quebec government doesn't give, but of course the Quebec City elite is very much part of this. So education is an important part of what they do. A lot of it's botanical, but the family is a very important part of it as well. I don't know how much they would learn about forestry. I mean, interestingly enough, Jolie, I didn't have time to get into this, but he was one of these people who was totally into um, growing exotic trees. So. Still there today, there's the Black Walnut uh, Plantation, which is the furthest north in North America. And when he was in Victoria, he was constantly 
planting uh, exotic trees. And in fact, there's a, in front of the Victoria Lieutenant Governor's House, it's called Lobinier Street as well. And a lot of those trees that are there today, in fact, there's a group in Victoria that uh, dedicated to preserving within the walls, of, uh, Nicholas knows as well, um, this garden and so on. Uh, but I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've only been there off season and I'm, I can't really answer you in detail, but they've got nice little publications that give you details and so on. And in fact, there's just a biography. Uh, his father's, um, tra his father wrote, everyone in the family wrote travel memoirs. I mean, this is why I know so much about his brother. He wrote when he was in, you know, traveling through India, trying to get to his troop, going through very dangerous territory, suicidal, really. He's got a daily diary, and when he's in Crimea, he's writing a daily diary. And Jolie, when he was a young boy in Paris, was in, he has to write diaries. That's what his father insists. And his father wrote, traveled all over the world and wrote diaries. And he was a colonialist in South America and so on. Anyway, some of that has now been published, came out this year. And so that'll be very much featured at this place as well. So I'd like to ask a biology question. So did they use the word sustainable in, in those? No, I made that one up. I mean, okay. I made, I'm applying but it. They, but I'm saying it's yeah. uh, what I would call a sustained yield forestry because yeah. He, that forest is still there. I mean, it was cut a certain amount of trees, were cut every year, he never expected. A expand. certain amount could, yeah. would, could be sustained. Cursor to what we call sustained yield forestry, essentially, but no, the term wasn't used. <clears throat> Thanks, Jack. I really like um, how you're trying to understand these contradictions. Uh, and I don't know, I, I mean, I'm obviously curious about the, the way that he thought about China Chinese people, the Chinese system of government. How do you explain that? How do you explain uh, his defense of of Chinese immigrants or non-white immigrants? How does that fit within the, the larger picture? No, I mean, he, I'm not sure he was any any kind of a scholar of China. I mean, in fact, he wasn't very intellectual at all, right? I've looked at his, what's left of the library. There's not much there. Uh, economic, Adam Smith, stuff like that more. Um, but he uh, was the one chosen to... Uh, take this Chinese viceroy uh, when he toured through, well, he toured through the United States, right? It's a famous case, uh, and he wrote about it. The, the, and, um, and when he was in Canada, Jolie was his escort, took him to the Toronto exhibition and so on. And, um, and so whether, what his understanding of China is, how sophisticated it is, I really don't know whether he's just supporting them for human rights sort of reasons. I mean, he wasn't a strong supporter of the natives. And when the Duke of Boers were applying for land, uh, he basically said, forget it, because you guys don't, don't recognize the state. Therefore, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be allowed into BC. So, but basically, what I'm saying is he's not a racist, unlike most of the people at that time. And he had a certain respect for what he considered to be an old civilization. Beyond that, I really can't add much. Thanks for a great talk, Jack. Um, I like the way you situate yourself outside of this rise of modernity historiography, and you kind of show Jolie's sort of... Getting a little old now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, but in many ways, though, you presented the image of a very modern man. He's his hybrid, he's his hybrid creation. Uh, he's not one or the other. He's this mix of conflicting forces and all of this. So... Is this is this anti-modern? Is this not modern, or, is, or or could we think of seeing still seeing the rise of modernity, but in a different way? Right now, the book's coming out. <laughs> <but you know. laughs> yeah, so he's quintessentially modern by being uh, postmodern in a way, right? And it's just because he's not um, representing a strict trajectory. Yeah, well, you could call him postmodern man instead of modern man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering whether um, he could have read Thomas Carlyle because the way you spoke about his ideology with sort of you know, home, family, religion on the one hand, a kind of modern liberal take on, an, on another, uh, the, paternal, the older paternalism, and yet at the sort of third front. It sounds, I mean, it reminded me of Thomas Carlyle. Yeah. That name uh, didn't come up in his correspondence. He did, you know, talk about what he was reading occasionally with people he wrote to, but a lot of it tended to be about religion, you know, disputes within the Anglican Church and, you know, uh, uh, high church versus low church and things like that, mostly English. But um, uh, so he may well have read Carlyle. I don't know, but it's it's not some 
Yeah, yeah, I probably had, because I think a lot of his reading was certainly English, even though he was educated in French. I don't see too much evidence of having read much uh, in the way of French philosophers or whatever. It was very traditional. I mean, he certainly didn't, you know, the word Darwin never comes up, so on. You know, it's, uh. I was hoping that he would have been mixed up in, I mean, if you go into the Anglican Cathedral in Quebec City today, there's huge windows to him and all kinds of recognition, but he, uh, there's not much evidence that he played a really important role in the church, and um, perhaps he had too many other things to do. Uh, but he certainly, Quebec church, the Anglican church was very fractious in a way. It was uh, evangelical and, uh, you know, it was, you know, kind of, there were those very, there's a recent book by Richard Baudry on this. So it was a very fractured kind of uh, group at the time. And maybe Jolie just wanted to, because he was always the conciliator. You know, he just didn't want to get involved with it. But he was involved with Bishop's College School. As one of his sons went there and, of course, his sons went to Royal Military College and so on. But so we have, <coughs> oh, another question? Good. You said in the chapter on British Columbia, in the chapter when he's the Lieutenant governor, governor, that he, uh, he really changed the nature of, of politics and, and put it in more partisan, traditional party structures. Yeah, I, I argue that. I mean, uh, that? 1903 is seen as a pivotal date in BC, but it's interesting when you read the histories, the BC histories of this, they never mention Jolie. I mean, it's like somehow Brooke Bride did this on his own. But it was Jolie who handpicked him to become the premier, and that was the first time that the, the cabinet had only one uh, party in it. Laurier wasn't very happy about this because they happened to be conservatives, <laughs> and he didn't want to renew Jolie for that reason. What gave him the idea to do that? I think he was sent out here to do that. Sorry? He was sent here to do that. Yeah. I mean, New Brunswick, my first thesis, actually, uh, MA thesis on New Brunswick politics in the 1890s. A lot of the provinces had a, you know, what we consider a nonpartisan system, like we have in municipalities outside Burnaby and so on, and um, I don't know railways and all kinds of pressures. They're moving towards a party system, and BC was a, one of the later ones, I guess. And because we'd gone through about five premiers in five years, BC po BC politics were a mess, right? And so he was because Jolie had this reputation of being distinguished, and of course you got all these Brits out here in Victoria. He, so he's, you know, you can see him. As, he fit in like a glove here in Victoria. They loved him, um, and um, so um, he's got the experience. He's got the, you know, the. Uh, the uh, in fact, it's very paradoxical, but um, he was lost office basically because the liberal, when the conservatives came in in Ottawa, they fired Letelier de Saint Just put in a uh, conservative uh, uh, lieutenant governor, and the lieutenant governor basically got Jolie out. So he did the same thing <laughs> in reverse. And, and when he was here, right, I mean, he, he's the one who uh, told uh, the previous government they would have to go and appointed a new governor. That's the last time in, cons in Canadian history that a lieutenant governor has had that kind of influence. Uh, in fact, they're more powerful than, than governors general are. Governors general, uh, because they're you know, they're responsible to the queen or whatever, then their powers are limited. The lieutenant governors are tools of Ottawa, and therefore they have, they've played a more important role. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it took three years, and that that's a, that's a reflects Jolie's sense of patience. He was very cautious in and, and, and doing that. So, so in two weeks, we have Mark Winston, who's a biologist but has been running the semester in dialogue for three or four years and um, like to, when there's light refreshments outside and um, join me in thanking Dr. Little again.